Be'ezat Hashem, Na'aseh V'Natzliach. I want to welcome you to another session of our Tefillah 101 class as we continue our in-depth learning of the Amidah. Baruch Hashem, we're up to the 15th Beracha, which also is the 12th Bakasha. It's the final Bakasha. From here we move on to the next section. Before we get into the details of that, I'd like to give some honorable mentions and dedications to the following people. This class will be to the Hatzlacha of the Avidar family, Noam Zachariah ben Sion and his family, Yochebet bat Lea, Yaakov ben Yochebet, Zachariah ben Yochebet, Yael bat Yochebet, Yosef bat Yochebet, and to Rachel bat Sarah, Galia, and Dorit bat Rachel. To Hashem Barech Otchem, Sameach Otchem, and Be'ezat Hashem, Dev Shalom Bait Amiti. Also, we have in Balba Jacqueline and Batchen Bat Jacqueline sponsoring the class for Zivug Hagun, Mishor Shishmatam, for Piria Beriva, Bimera, Bimera, Bimera. Also, we have uh, our friend Hanania, who we're doing the class of Refua Shirma with his wife Janet Batsimi and his brother Shlomo Ben Hana and Sion Ben Hana. Also, Rina and our own Perko. Uh, Aaron Mayer Ben Rafael Mendel is sponsoring the class for Berchan and Sachan, his works from Bayed, good chinook for his children, and Rina Bat Jacqueline for good health, good chinook for his children, and she married to give birth to more healthy and holy children. And that uh, David Shalom and Ora Alia Bat Nerignab will be healthy, blessed with good midot and Berchan Sachan, the ways of Hashem. And she Hashem bless everyone with good mazal and bakol, mikol, kol. Amen. Amen. Also, a good friend Amen. of the class, Yudit Ben Shabbat. Hashem Ba'echota, Samechota, should have health, wealth, success. Bechaba Tzacha, Bechoma Se'elaich. Be'ezat Hashem, that your children, Noam Elimelech and Hashem Meir, Ya'alu Ma'la, Ma'la Batura, should be G'dolei Ador, Be'ezat Hashem. And also, it should be, should that today, Lui Nishmat of Abraham Yoshua Ben Sultana, Simon Ben Alia, and Mazal Bat Luna. Also, Avigail Bat Sara is sponsoring the class of the Refua Shinema of Lavi Raphael Ben Olga. Also, uh, even though that we celebrated on Monday, but we want to wish our good friend Dov Shmuel a, a happy birthday, Admea Ve'esrim, in good health, Beirut Eitana, Simchat Chaim, that you and Pesi Penina be, uh, have Shlom Bayit Amiti, Panasa B'Shefa, Barcha V'atzacha B'chom HaSedechem, and Be'ezat Hashem, Kedosh Baruch Hu Malel, Kom Yishot Yibchem Netova. Also, we have Anonymous, who is uh, sponsoring the class to the Ilui Nishmat of Yehuda Ben Aharon and Brendel, Bet, uh, Brendel Bat Maidov. That, uh, that they're going to, that we're going to be, Bezat Hashem Bli Neder, be uh, dedicating all the Torah classes up until the second day of Pesach. Wow. wow. In honor of that special lady. Wow, wow, wow. And thank you so much for Anonymous for sponsoring and for uh, learning with us as well. Welcome. Also, Amen. we have one last but definitely not least uh, final sponsor for tonight, the big sponsor of tonight. Uh, you know, in order to understand the sponsorship, you have to understand the Berachah that we're doing today. The Berachah that we're doing is Baruch Atah Hashem Matzmiach Keren Yeshua. Yeshua. The Hashem right. is, it sprouts or blooms the, the coming of, uh, of our salvation of Mashiach. However, if you pay attention to Matzmiach Keren Yeshua, we happen to know somebody named Keren in the room. <laughs> and her lovely husband, her lovely husband, Dovid Barman, says, how can he not sponsor the class that says, wow. Matzmiach yeah. Keren, Keren Yeshua. Yeshua. Wow. 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 I love it. So David, we have David Barman, who is doing in honor of his wife Keren, who is Matzmiach, who is my Matzmiach Keren Yeshua. Wow. Uh, it, it gets better and better. This is called 
religious romantic, unbelievable. That's beautiful. And they should always be together, always should be in peace, always be happy. You have nachat from your children, nachat from your grandchildren, and you should have a long life and good health. Amen. And last and not least, 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 <laughs> is my good friend uh, Abe Lincoln that is here all the way from Canada. As, uh, he's here on vacation, but Baruch Hashem was able to be part of three classes already. Hashem and your family, and your children, and your, you should have Parnasah Shefa, Shlom Bayit Amiti, Shinuch Yiladim B'Derech Hashem, Barachah B'Atzachah, and all that you do. And for all the people that are in attendance, that make an effort to come every single week and come and learn, that also you should always, you know, the be on, you should, uh, that Hashem should pay you uh, a thousand times over for the effort that you make for learning Torah every single Thursday. Uh, uh, and it's, it's a true testament of how you want to get close to Hashem, understand Hashem, understand the Torah, understand the religion, know how to connect, learn how to pray. Mamash, it's, uh, it's very admirable uh, to see all the people in the room that have taken... Uh, upon themselves to connect and to stick with it. I'm very proud of you. And uh, let the Shem, all the Torah blessings to you and yours. Amen. All right, Amen. let's get started. So, in order to just give us a quick, quick catch up on where we are, we'll just do a small introduction to the structure of the Amidah. Next week we'll probably not do this anymore because we'll get past this section and we've done it 12 times. This is the final time. So the Amidah has a structure. The first three Berachot are Sheva, which is the praise of a Kadosh Baruch Hu. The middle 12 Berachot are the Berachot of Bakashot. Bakashot are the supplications, the, 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 the request that we have for Kadosh Baruch Hu. And then the last three berachot are the berachot that are connected to Hoda'a, when we praise the Kadosh Baruch Hu. The middle ones, the ones that have to do with bakashot, the ones that have to do with uh, the requests, get split into four. The first three are for our personal spiritual needs. The second set of three berachot is for our personal physical needs, material, material needs, and then we shift over to the collective needs of Am Yisrael. And the first three are for the spiritual needs of, the, uh, of Am Yisrael, and the last three are for the material needs of Am Yisrael. We are now in the final one. Bracha uh, number, I'm sorry, Bakasha number 12, Bracha number 15. Now, We've been in an envelope of tefillah that has been themed around one thing, which is the redemption. Mi birkat kibbutz galuyot, ad birkat matzmiach keren Yeshua, kol abrachot oskot b'shlavim shonim shel talich ha-geula leumi. Meaning, from the time that we started matzmiach keren Yeshua, up until this final beracha that we're learning tonight, the entire time there has been a running theme, a common denominator, which is we're praying for the redemption. Mm -hmm. So in order to get to tonight's beracha, I'll give you a review of Matzmiach Kerin Yeshua up until tonight, so you can see how each one leads up into the next one. So we started with Kibbutz Galuyot, and it, uh, that beracha deals with the uh, with the, 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 the lofty task of collecting all of Am Yisrael from four corners of the earth to our homeland of Israel. Following that was the Beracha that begs us to pray for a different reality, a better reality, the way things used to be. Jews living like Jews in the land of Israel with Bet HaMikdash built, with Shoftim and Yoatzim. As the Beracha says, Bring us back to when we used to have the judges and the advisors. So the Shoftim would judge between Adam and Chavero in legal matters according to Torah law. 
and the Yatsim were advisors, spiritual advisors, and they were able to give you specific spiritual advice to be successful on your spiritual journey in this world. And in that reality, when we have Shoftim and Yatsim, we were able to be successful as individuals, we were able to be successful as a society, and we also did it as the, as the Bracha says, Beyachad. As it says over there, doesn't say it over there. We said that, that the whole the idea was that we were successful as, uh, as a society because we were able to be uh, dealt with with Torah law. And because Torah law kept us together, we had Ahdud. Then we went to Alaminim Velamashinim. In Alaminim Velamashinim, we said that the Rambam said it's the most important Beracha of all. That's why it was added to the Amidah. As we pray for the downfall of evil empires, corrupt governments, and heretics, and the ways of the wicked to change. And then we went on to the spiritual bakashot from Amisrael. Ala tzadikim, v'ala chasidim. And we said over there that all these different groups of people that we pray for, the righteous, the, the elderly, the, the, the geret tzedek. And we said that because Hashem protects the righteous, which are the tzaddikim, the chassidim, and then it goes into Sharif HaMech HaYisrael, Zikneem, Pletat Betzofrem, Geret Tzedek, Ve'alenu, when there's protection of the righteous, we have the, uh, and uh, the righteous are amongst us, they protect us, and we spoke about how when the tzaddikim are around us, we have this extra protection because they are around. And we actually mentioned Rabbi Weberman, and how uh, Rabbi Sharbani mentioned that when he passed away, how we felt like we lost a certain type of protection here in Miami, and certainly how we felt when we lost Rabbi Vadia, Zichon Livracha, and all these uh, big rabbis that are not there, and, and, and more and more it seems like the onus is on us to bring Mashiach, as these spiritual giants are, are no longer around us. And when the righteous are amongst us, we're spiritually strong, and we're capable of the re rebuilding of Yerushalayim. And that's why the next Berecha is Tishkom Vitoch Yerushalayim. When we have the Tzadikim, when we have the Hasidim, when we have the, we have the personnel, now we can build the building. And we prepare for the Messianic era by building the third Bet HaMikdash, brick by brick, setting the stage for coming of Mashiach. And we spoke about how we're doing it, uh, we've been doing it for hundreds of years, and we're doing it today. And that brings us to today's lesson, the final Bekasha of Matzmiach Keren Yeshua. Obviously, we had a lot more in-depth learning. I just gave you broad strokes on how we got here. But tonight's lesson is Matzmiach Yeshua. So it's worth mention, mentioning the special significance of the number 15, as this is the 15th Beracha. That... When we started the Amidah, the first Bercha is called the Birkat Avot. And we said we discussed uh, Avraham Avinu. Mm -hmm. So Avraham Avinu was connected to Bercha number one. Because he represents the beginning of Jewish history. When you go all the way to the 15th Bercha, mm -hmm. which is the climax of Jewish history, is when? Is when we have David... Malka Meshicha, when we have the Mashiach. So that's why number 15 is the climax, the end of when it starts with Abraham and then it ends up with the kingdom of David. What's interesting about this, <laughs> the 15th generation from Abraham Avinu was who? If you want Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Shlomo, you're very close, one more. Shlomo Amelech. Shlomo Amelech was number 15. And we know that Shlomo Amelech was the king, and he was the it, it, he, he came from the royal house of David, which reached its zenith like a full moon. Which, by the way, on which day of the week, I mean, which day of the month is the full moon? The fifteenth. So similarly, and and, and what and what <laughs> well, and what are we assimilated to? What are we connected to? The goyim are the shemesh, and Amisel is the the, 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 the moon. moon. Mm -hmm. So similarly, 
just like the moon is full on the 15th, just like the 15th generation from Abraham Avinu is Shlomo HaMelech, similarly the 15th Beracha in the Amidah comes to show us that, the, that, that when do we, are we going to be like Shlomo? When are we going to be like the full moon? When we have the Melech HaMashiach coming, that's going to be that, uh, the, that reality. And that's why it's placed number 15. Furthermore, it says that for a Jew, his ultimate dream of a Jew is the Messianic era. The ultimate, ultimate reality that a Jew wants to have is to be part of Yemeh Mashiach. Why? Well, not why, but if we, if we know that that is our ultimate dream, then this is something, that's what we strive for, right? Like little kids, when, they, when they're in school, they always say, when you grow up, what do you want to be, right? So they tell them all these different professions that they want to, that they want to be, right? Yeah. When you get a little bit older, you don't say, what do you want to be? You're already that. So you ask a different question. What's your dream, right? What do you want? What's your dream? If you had a perfect life, what would it be? For every Jew, the answer would be to live in the time of Mashiach. There's no sure. other better reality than that. So how many people are striving for that dream, right? So it says over here that whatever a person's problems, heartaches, aspirations, goals, a Jew should always have in, in the foremost in his mind the yearning to greet Mashiach. If, I, if you ever ask me like, oh, what is the number one thing that you want to do in your life? To shake hands with Mashiach, to see Mashiach, to be part of the reality of the built-out Bet HaMikdash, Wood Yerushalayim, and the Melech Mashiach ruling over us. So we aspire for it, we strive for it, but it, you know, some people are living it as their reality. You know, sometimes some people would say that the Chabad came, and that's all they think about Mashiach, Mashiach, Mashiach. But that's something that's actually for every single Jew. It's the ultimate dream, the ultimate reality that one should aspire for. The Yarot Dvash brings something very interesting over here. He says that. A person, a Jew, should cry an endless stream of bitter tears when praying for Yerushalayim and for Malchut David to be a reality, because without them, the soul is estranged from God. Well, this is a very large statement, and I just wanted to, uh, to, to use different words. Basically, that the soul is lacking closeness to God, when it lives in the reality without a rebuilt Yerushalayim and a Mashiach. Imagine how your neshama would feel like, imagine what your Jewish experience would be like if a reality was that the, the Bet HaMikdash was built and that we were living in, in, in Israel and, and we have a king, we have a leader, we have the Mashiach. It says that a neshama feels that it's estranged from God when it lives in a reality that's not that. So we don't know any better, right? All we know is what we know. So the Yarod Vash is telling us now that whatever you're feeling right now is not even close to what it would be if you were living in the Messianic era. Furthermore, when we go from one Biracha to the next, we try to figure out why they juxtaposed. Why is number 14 next to number 15? Why is the Birkat Tishkon Betoch Yerushalayim as we said in the, in, the, in the previous class about how we wanted God's holy presence to reside in Jerusalem and that the Kisset David, the Mashiach, should be, uh, should, uh, should be part of our reality. And of course the Binyan, the, you know, building the building, the third Bet HaMikdash, and the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Right. So if that's the, the, the previous Beracha, why is it juxtaposed to Et Semach David Abdecha Meherat Tatzmiach? Why is that the one that has to do with Mashiach? So it's very interesting. It says in Masechet Megillah on the 17th page on the second side and on the 18th page on the first side. I'll just uh, paraphrase and then I'll quote. He says, after the Bakasha to build Jerusalem, Ba Bakasha al Atzmachat Semach David. Right after we request the rebuilding of Jerusalem, comes the request of the blooming uh, flower of David, which in a second we'll also go into the, the text, its meaning, and the choice of words. Because this is the order of redemption. 
as it says in the Gemara. Kevan she nivnet Yerushalayim, ba David. When Jerusalem is built out, naturally the next step is the coming of David HaMelech. Why? Because it's a pasuk in Nevi'im that says, Achar yashuru b'nei Yisrael uvikshu et Hashem Elohem ve'et David Malkam. So the pasuk shows us, first he built that Jerusalem, and that, which has a, a, a place for God's holy presence to reside, and then they can ask for David Malkam, then they can ask for the, the Melech. If you recall, we were talking about Shibulei Aleket, about how the angels always said something, and be, uh, when they noticed some sort of uh, an event happening in Jewish history, and they would chime in, and would, they say this one thing, and from this one thing that they said, it had something to do with the Beracha and the, and the wording of the Amidah. So on this particular Beracha, what did the angels say? That they said, Matzmiach Keren Yeshua. So Shibulei Aleket says, the Malachi Asharet Beit Meoratam Meoraot Ba'Olam. You know the heavenly angels when they would see all these events unfolding in the world. When the Jewish people uh, were saved during the time of the splitting of the sea during the Exodus, Vamru Shira, and they said the Shira Tayam, that song that they sang when the sea split. Sheneemar Ba Vayosha Hashem Bayom Ahu. Et Israel miad Mitzrayim. It says that pasuk over there. Vayosh Hashem et Israel et Israel miad Mitzrayim. Vayom Ahu. Right. It says that Hashem saved the Jewish people from the Egyptians on that day. As soon as they saw that, Patchu Malachi Asharet, the heavenly angels said, Baruch Ata Hashem Matzmiach Kerem Yeshua. So when they saw that, they said, Look how Hashem Matzmiach Kerem Yeshua. Shibula Leket has every single beracha. And what the angel said about it, what the angel said about it, we've been following it the entire uh, time that we've been learning, it's also very, very interesting. Furthermore, when we get to this beracha, we have to understand the words, and then we're going to di dissect the words. But overall, we always want to start off with, what is my kavana? What is my intention? I'm about to say, Baruch Atah Hashem, Matzmeach Keren Yeshua. What is my kavana for this beracha? Ritzoni bebracha zo, levakesh mimcha, shetatzmeach vetegale et malchut Mashiach ben David. Simply put, my intention when I say this beracha is that I'm asking from God to reveal, to sprout, to bring into life the kingdom of Mashiach ben David. That's my intention. That's my kavana over here. Let's get into the text. It says, Et tzemach David avdecha meherat atzmiach. So I'm going to do a pshat, like a very simple interpretation of the words. That, it, that might sound like it doesn't make sense, but later on you'll see that everything will fall into place. So the word tzemach means like plant, right? Like to sprout. So I'm just going to, you know, translate it as such. Et tzemach David Avdecha, the plant, the tree, the root, the, the sprouting of David, your servant, meherat mm -hmm. quickly let it grow. Vekarno tarum beishuatecha. So, hold on. What are we asking here? When we say, It's obviously cryptic, but what we're really trying to say is that we want HaKadosh Baruch Hu to bring the rulership of the Melech HaMashiach into this world. Bring it, bring it forth. It, it, it's basically telling us that make him strong is a, is a language of strength. Elevate it with your salvations. Why? Because we're constantly waiting for your salvation. Every day. All day. That the Kadosh Baruch Hu is the one that is, brings forth, sprouts, uh, brings into reality the strength of the salvation of Mashiach. It's very choppy. 
only when we go word by word, it'll start to fit in. Let's start with the first three words. Etzemach David. The plant of David, Avdecha, your servant, Meherat to quickly sprout. So what is this about? What is this plant? So, Matzmiach Ke Yeshua, why is it called Etzemach David? Why is it Lashon Tzemach? Which in modern Hebrew means plant. Ki Mashiach ben David, Tzemach Shemo. Mashiach ben David, his name is Tzemach. As it says in Zechariah, on the sixth chapter, the twelfth pasuk, Hine ish Tzemach Shemo. He says that there's going to be a person and his name is going to be Tzemach. And from him we'll be able to rebuild the, 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 the house of God. For anyone who is a Gemara learner, we see that there is a very interesting word that starts the Beracha. Et Tzemach David. This beracha could have started with just the word David. Tzemach David. Or David, right? Why is it et tzemach? So it says, Vamila et ba lerabot. It comes to add. Oh. To add what? Mashiach ben Ephraim. O et Eliyahu navi sheba lefanav. When you see the word et, every time you see the word et, it comes to add. Ba lerabot. As a matter of fact, I'll bring the Gemara. The Gemara is from Masechet Pesachim, Daf Chaf Bet, Amud Bet. It says, Kedetanya, Shimon Amsoni, Vamrile Nachamei Amsoni, Haya Doresh Kol Etim Sheba Torah. There used to be a, a person called Shimon Amsoni. Some people used to call him Nachamei Amsoni, either or, but it's the same individual. And he had a special quality. Every single Et, Aleph Taf, which means uh, the word et in the Torah, <laughs> he would have a special explanation to it. Whoa. He would go for every word et, uh, et, et, and love, uh, how, how, what's the word for et in English? Uh, honor your, your. Et on the, uh, honor your God. Et, uh, you know, loosely, loosely translated that word et is your. So every time he saw that word in, uh, in, in the Torah, he had a special re- uh, explanation to it. <coughs> Until he came across one. <laughs> so he says, what is What is the et? He couldn't come up with it. What happened? He says, I'm retiring. <laughs> I was successful 99.99% of the time. My theory doesn't hold 100%. Et I hit a roadblock. This final et, I don't know how to do it. All my et's before make no sense. Because if this doesn't make sense, all uh, well, the other ones don't make sense, he lets go. Amru lo talmidav, Rebbe, kol etim shedarash tomatehalem. So his students tell all the etim that you said before, what are you going to do with them? Amar lahem, keshem shekibalti sachar la drisha, kachem kabel sachar la prisha. He says, just like I got reward to darshan on it, right. now I'm going to get the reward for, for, uh, for retiring from it. Until Rabbi Akiva comes and he tells him, no, 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 I'll give it to you. When it says, Et Hashem Elokecha, you know what's Et? Lerabot Talmidei Chachamim. Meaning, to add Torah learners, to add Talmidei Chachamim. Meaning what? It says, fear God. And the word et is lerabot, is to add, to exclude, to, 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 uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, add to make greater. So what's greater than God? There's nothing greater than God. Well, what, could be, what could be on the same level? He says, the same way you honor God is the way, same way you honor the rabbis. Same way you honor the Torah learners. So now that we learned that from the Gemara, let's go back to the Beracha. When it says et, tzemach David, what is et? Every time there's an et, it comes to lerabot, it comes to add. So it tells us, Tzemach, that David, Mashiach ben David. Et lerabot, Mashiach ben Yosef. That there's two Mashiachim, and that's why there's an et over there. Oh. 
By the way, since we're on the names of Mashiach, you should know that Mashiach has several names. And they're all included in the acronym Mashiach. Mashiach is Rashi Tevot to all the names of Mashiach. Mm-hmm. Mashiach has, besides being called Tzemach, as we saw over here, brought down in Zechariah, and then he may be Tavdi Tzemach, which is Mashiach. The word Mashiach also stands for Mem Shin Yud Chet, Menachem, Shiloh, Inon, Chanina. Those are the four names of Mashiach. And that's hinted in the word Mashiach. Mem is for Menachem, Shin is for Shiloh, Yud is for Inon, Chet is for Chanina. And why so many names, if you ask? Should Mashiach just have one name? Why so many names? And also, why was the word Tzemach chosen? Because it has, typically has to do with uh, flowers or, or, or agriculture. What does it have to do with Mashiach? So it's very interesting. It says that the reason why he has a lot of different names is because it, re- it represents different aspects of the Mashiach's character. Great people or complex people, they excel in numerous different areas. The Mashiach is going to have several different names because they reflect many different facets of his special character. Meaning, he's Menachem because of one side of his character. He's Shiloh because another side of his character. He's going to be a very special individual. So special that he requires to have several different names and each one defines a different type of his character. But why Tzemach? That word is a little bit out of place. Because the word semach has to do with flowers, has to do with agriculture. What does that have to do with Mashiach? So it says that Biata Mashiach, Hiye Bede Chatzmacha. He says that the coming of Mashiach is going to be like the growth of a plant. That's why it says Matzmiach Yeshua, right? There's going to be also the, 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 the blooming of the salvation. He says, Kmo Tzemach shelifne gidulo nirkav ken lifne bidat Mashiach yesh ikveta de Mashiach. It says, just like a plant, before a plant grows, what is the process? You put a seed in the ground, it rots, it decays. And just when it comes to the final stage before it dies, it gives a big push of the little bit of life that it has in it, and it sprouts anew. So it says that's, the, that's exactly what's going to be in the final generation called Ikvet the Mashiach, which is our generation. Ah. What's going to be? Tzarot Rabot. There's going to be a lot of problems. He says, just like the, the decay of the seed, similarly will be the decay of the generation, of the time of Ikvita the Mashiach. There's going to be a lot of problems. And the coming of Mashiach is going to be like the way a plant behaves. Slowly, slowly is going to be the footsteps of the Messianic era. It's not going to come suddenly. Mashiach doesn't come by surprise. It's slowly but surely it's going to come. Now, in Ikvita the Mashiach, society will need to rot. We're doing that now. <laughs> right? They're going to, the society is going to go through a process of decay. It's going to deteriorate to the lowest level possible, and then it'll be the time of Mashiach. And you just, you took the words right out of my mouth. Don't we feel like that's what's happening? Don't we feel like all of a sudden, like, society is like on a landslide, just deteriorating and decaying? The, the you know, the morals and the mores of the, of the people is just out of control and deteriorating. As a matter of fact, the Gemara speaks of this, of this generation. In Masechet Sanhedrin, in Masechet Sotah. Bless you. Thank you. I'll just read an excerpt of what it says over there. It says, in the time of, in the time of Mashiach, or the birth, Hevle Mashiach, the birth pangs, of the Messianic era, the pain will be as intense and unbearable 
as of that of a mother giving labor. Do you ever see a woman when she gives birth? She's going through such pain, it's unbearable. She yells, she screams. In modern medicine, they've learned how to dull that a little bit with uh, Epidural. epidurals and such and whatever. But back in the day, you know, you know, it, that's one of the punishments of Chava. It says that the, the same way that a woman goes through that hard, uh, you know, painful, unbearable pain of, of labor, similarly will be the feeling of the people that live during the time of Chevle Mashiach, in the birth pangs of Mashiach. As a matter of fact, the Gemara also says in Masechet Sanhedrin, on the 98th page on the second side, Yaiti velo echimine. It says, let the, t- let the Messianic era come, but I don't want to see him. Meaning, let the Mashiach come, but I don't want to see him. I believe it's Rashbi that he, says he, it. He doesn't want to be doing that time. It's Rashbi, isn't it? Who was that? I believe it's Rashbi. I, th- I, I believe it's Rashbi. He says, let, let Mashiach come, but I don't want to be there that time. I don't want to no. see him. That's how the coming of Mashiach is good. But the Messianic era, the the Hebrew Mashiach, I don't want to see. Rabbi Mansour, Rabbi Mansour gave a beautiful chidush about this one. He says the coming of Mashiach is coming, right? That's what we want. But to be on the iPhone, I don't want to see. To be on the phone all day long watching it with all the things that they got us on the social media, that that, that I don't want to see. So the Talmud in Masechet Sanhedrin and in Masechet Sota speaks about Ikvita de Mashiach and it talks about it will be a catastrophic period where there's going to be chutzpah and there, there'll be, uh, you know, there'll, 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 there'll be insolence that's met with no protest. The young will humiliate the old. The old will feel compelled to show honor to the young. The sons will curse their fathers. The daughters will attack their mothers. The wives will fight with their mother-in-laws. A man's family will turn against him and become his enemies. Torah wisdom will be despised. And those who fear sin will be degraded. And the truth will be unknown. Uh, The last line, I'll reword it. Torah wisdom will be despised. We see that all of a sudden the religious Jew gets such a hard time, even in their homeland. I'm not talking about right. run-of-the-mill oh, yeah. anti-Semitism all over yeah. the world in the diaspora. That we expect. But for the Torah wisdom to be despised in Israel, yeah. uh, sure. that's, that, that, that's, the, that's the, 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 the Gemara coming to life today. And those who fear sin, the religious Jew, will be degraded. They speak so lowly about the Jew in the world right now. And the truth will be unknown. We see that today, like, you know, like the, this, this coined phrase, fake news. You know, you, Couldn't that's be more it. Perfect. Couldn't be more perfect. Can't believe nothing. You can't believe nothing anymore. Everybody's in somebody's pocket. You literally don't know what's the truth. As it says there in, uh, in the Gemara. The Arizal also talks about Ikveta de Mashicha. And he says that Ikveta de Mashicha will be in the Shar Nun of Tum'ah. The 50th level of Tum'ah. The lowest, lowest, lowest level of Tum'ah is where we're going to be. So right away you're going to say, hey, I thought that 49th was the lowest one. 49 was so low that we had to run away because God forbid you get into the 50th level, you can't get out of it. So how's Arizal telling us 50? He says, yeah, that's for the, for the generation of the Jews that lived in Egypt. That's before they received the Torah. Now that we have the Torah, we can go into the 50th and still get out. So it says that in the time of Ikvita and the Mashiach, we're going to be the bottom of the barrel, the worst of the Tum'ah. Meaning whatever we thought that Egypt was at 49, it's not even close to what we're going to be experiencing when we see it. I mean, really, Bemet, Bemet, it's almost disgusting to turn on the news or to, to see you know, videos. It's, it, 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 it's, it, it's, uh, uh, it's damaging to the Neshama to see those images, to read those words, to see that people are acting that way. But that's what it's going to be. It's the 50th level of Tumah. But we can get out of it. Why? Because we have the Torah. The Torah is going to help us to get out of it. We have the ability to go to the 50th level and still survive. So that's why during these times when you see this moral decline in the world and, and things seem like they're beyond repair, the only silver lining 
the Mashiach is coming. That's it. That's a silver lining, is that Mashiach is coming. In the Berecha, when we say, Et Tzemach David Abdecha, we just said Tzemach. Okay, let's read it again. Watch how now it's going to be a little bit smoother. Et Tzemach David. Of course, Tzemach, that's the Mashiach. Mm-hmm. And which one is it? Mashiach ben David. Why do I have the word Et over there? Ah, that's for Mashiach ben Yosef. Because Et comes to Lerabot, comes ah. to include. Uh-huh. So Et Tzemach David. Okay, Avdecha, of course, he's the servant of God. Meherat Atzmiach. But we said the whole process slowly. So why are we saying Mehera? We just Speedily. said that the process has to be like a plant. Slowly it's going to come. So why are we asking for Mehera? It doesn't make sense. We just learned that we have to accept that the salvation process, the redemption is going to happen slowly. Then why is the word Mehera quickly there? It sort of like cancels each other out. So the word Mehera means that we want the process to unfold speedily. Not that we want the re- redemption to occur in an instant, meaning we don't want Mashiach now. I don't know if Mashiach now is like the... I've heard of a bunch of things about people saying about the whole concept of Mashiach now. But <laughs> it's not that we want in an instant, like a flash of lightning. Rather, the Vilna Gaon explains that each stage should pass quickly and not be delayed unnecessarily. Meaning, Bimhera, okay, we're in this stage right now. Like, as, as, uh, as I heard from many people, and especially I heard from also, it was mind-opening when the, when, the, when the rabbi mentioned it. And the rabbi, I have to say, I mentioned it in this class many times. Rabbi Sharbani said in one of his drashot, is that we're going through a biru. We're going through a separation. Mil Hashem Eli. Hashem is now, we're in that stage, right? We're in that stage where Hashem is now exposing everybody. Which school is for Jews or not, which country, uh-huh. which po- politician, which Jew in Israel, which, uh, it's like almost there's like a separation of Biru. So we say, since we're in this stage, Mehra, let's, let's go to the next stage. When we go through these stages, let's go, Mehra, Tetzmiach. Let's go through each stage and not get delayed. Because you know, sometimes you, uh, you can do things very, very quickly. That the stage should go quickly. Not that Mashiach should come in an instant. That the stage that we go through, that smicha should be happening. Meaning each stage should go through uh, faster rather than the coming of the Mashiach now. As uh, as a matter of fact, the when we said about when we said about. Oh, I have a good example. I have a good example of what it means to come fast. For it to come speedily. Here it is. The Chafetz Chaim says, We know that the time of Mashiach is very much connected to Shabbat. Right? It's like the... uh, like the seventh day. So before the days of Mashiach, it's like what? Erev Shabbat. So when Shabbat gets closer, what happens with us? How do we act right before Shabbat? So right away, we move fast, 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 right? The activity in the home quickens. We have all these last minute errands. We have these preparations for, uh, uh, preparations for each family member to hurry. He says, similarly, it's going to be the tempo of the world events speeding up in the time of the anticipation for the, uh, for the Messianic Shabbat. Meaning, right before Mashiach, what's going to happen? Just like before Shabbat, we move very fast because Shabbat is coming. Igbeta de Mashiach is Erev Shabbat. So things in the world are going to move very fast before Mashiach is coming. And how? He says, international events race across the newspaper headlines at a blurring pace. Remember how back in the days, oh, there's one thing, you talk about it for a very long time. Weeks, you're talking about one subject. You can't keep up. You can't keep up. Ukraine, Israel, China, America, Biden, Trump. Wow. He says, the world events are going to come at such a fast pace. 
Why? Because everything has to move faster, like things move fast on Erev Shabbat before Shabbat. Beautiful Chafetz Chaim, actually. Furthermore, it says in uh, in Masechet Sanhedrin about bringing Mashiach fast versus Mashiach coming slowly. They have a concept for that. It's called Amar Rabbi Alexander Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi Rame Chetiv Beita Uchtiv Achishena. Says in the in the in Isaiah, Yeshaya, it talks about the coming of Mashiach. That it can come in two ways, Be'ita, at its appointed time, or Achishena, we will hasten it, we'll bring it closely. Once again, I, I have, I brought Masechet Sanhedrin, but I'm just going to skip through it, because if we're going to go through it, we're going to spend a lot of time on it. It's beautiful, Masechet, uh, Daf, and the minute you open up into it, you just go more and more. So I'm just really, really going to just cherry pick the things instead of reading, reading it from the Gemara. So, there's two ways of bringing Mashiach. We can hasten it, or it comes at the, at the time that it's supposed to come. Now, Rabbi Yosha ben Levi dispatched Eliyahu Navi to go to Mashiach, and he told him, I want to speak to the Mashiach to ask him about when is he coming. So... And he wants to, he tells, he comes to him, he, he, uh, the, the holy Tana, Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, comes to the Mashiach. Mashiach greets him very warmly. And he tells him, when are you coming? And he answers his question, Hayom. Today. Today I'm coming. So, obviously, he didn't come that day. And many, many, many days after that. But the cryptic answer that Mashiach gave Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi is Hayom. He was citing the, the Pasuk from Tehilim and the Pasuk from the Chumash. Hayom in Bekolot Ishmael. Right? Me, meaning what? The day that you listen to the voice of God, that's the day the Mashiach is here. So you're asking Mashiach, when are you coming? When you listen to the word of God. When you heed God's words. Hayom. Hayom bin Kolot Ishmael, that's when Mashiach coming. So, the perf- and, and, and a, 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 a better explanation of that is when we do, when the performance of good deeds continue uninterrupted, surely Mashiach would be coming. I like this point a lot because what? When it's continuous and uninterrupted, don't you feel like things are starting to fizzle down yeah. a little bit? Yeah. Remember how we were two months ago? Mm-hmm. Remember how we were like a month ago? We were so united. We were so about being more religious, about doing things for Israel, praying, learning. We felt like, you know, that that's our role. That's what we need to be. And all of a sudden, what? You know, a few people fell off back to normal. You know, a few people are, you know, certain things are not like uh, as intense as they used to be. The coming of Mashiach is when things are continuous and uninterrupted. And that's the whole thing that we said. What's left in order to bring Mashiach? Every single rabbi said what? Continue the achdut, continue the tshuva. Continue the achdut, continue the tshuva. Continue the achdut, continue the tshuva. We'll be able to perform hayom in Bekolot We'll get there. You have to be continuous and uninterrupted. But it seems like, you know, people easily forget or you get desensitized or... You know, bad news, after you see it for 60 days straight, it becomes normal. Even bad news can become normal. You lose the, wow, did you hear? And, and even to strengthen the point, there's so many things coming one after the other. You know, it's not as, uh, it loses the wow factor after a while. However, however, if we're able to stick to our avodah of being united, Doing Teshuvah, Torah, Mitzvot, Masim Tovim, the classic formula to success. And even we also have another option of bringing Mashiach if we would observe two consecutive Shabbatot, one after the other, that would bring Mashiach. So if you want to bring it quickly, you can get it Hayom, right? You can get it in two weeks, right? You can get two Shabbatot. You can get it in one week. 
But if we don't do the things that bring it uh, then there's a time. There's a time. But the only thing is when you bring it uh, when you bring it closer, you also get the, the bonus of Bechesed Berachamim. It comes also, uh, you know, in a, in a better way, with mercy, mercy, right? Without the crazy wars, without the crazy, uh, you know, there's a there's an option to get it without gogu magog, or to or, or gogu magog would not be as intense. But if not, then you know the the prophets already spoke about that war. Another strange word that shows up in this bracha is the word Karen. Karen. The name is beautiful. The word in the Baracha is a bit strange. Because Karen in modern Hebrew is what? Horn. It's a horn, mm-hmm. right? Uh, like an animal's horn, Karen. Or a beam of light, right? Like a such a, uh, you know, a Karen of a Shemesh, right? The, the sun rays. So again, I asked the same question that I asked about Tzemach. What does a horn have to do with Mashiach? And I blow a big horn to let everybody know he's here. Huh? A big shofar, a big horn will be blown to notify everybody he's here. No, that's something else. Oh well. That's we did that already. Uh, in a in the in, I think in Kav uh, Shofar Gadol, we did that one. Here it's something else. There's some very interesting things that we're uh, that we can learn from this horn. Okay. Take a look at this. It says the horn. How does how does a horn grow? Slowly, also slowly. An animal grows its horn very slowly, also. So it says that just like a horn is a symbol of a gradual process, right? Where the animal is born has very small, and gradually they grow and grow in the animal's life. That's why the word keren is used over here in connection to Mashiach and to the redemption. Why? Because just like the keren of an animal grows slowly, the keren of Mashiach also, the process of the Messianic era is also going to happen slowly. Second one is karne or, what Ilan was saying before, rays of light. It says that sunrise, it doesn't happen in a single instant, right? We don't go from darkness to light. No. How does it work? Because it'd be, first of all, what happens when you go from instant, from darkness into instant light? It hurts the eyes, mm-hmm. right? It's not easy to, uh, to go from dark to light. So, Hashem arranged the sunrise to develop, our, to, to develop over a period of time. So the same thing is this, un, uh, this process to unfold gradually, allowing us to get accustomed to each stage before the next stage, until we finally get to the final stage of Mashiach, meaning... You know, like, you know, like, I, you know, I have like a, my son in the morning, you know, no matter how much you try to wake him up, but the minute you turn on that light, it's like a vampire, just so like, a, like, oh my God, the light, turn it off, turn it off. They can't handle that light so early in the morning as soon as they wake up. It's like they have to ease into it, all right? You can't go into extreme light. So similar, similarly is how Hashem is going to treat us in the time of Ikhbita the Mashiach. It's not going to go from where, where we are to this extreme reality of Mashiach, but slowly, stage by stage, just like the sunrise, <coughs> stage by stage, we'll get to the Geula. Also, we know that the the Bercha says, Vekarno tarum beishuatecha. When you say karno, it's a keren that belongs to somebody, right? His. It's the his, right? his horn. Yeah. Whose horn? Yeah. So this is the the horn of David the Melech. If you know the story of how he was anointed uh, to be a king, is the oil pour, pour, they pour the oil out of the horn that Shmuel Anavi had the special oil of uh, Shemina Mishcha, and it was on a, it, the, the container was a horn of an animal. And this flask, this horn, uh, Midrash Shochar Tov brings that when David 
uh, when uh, Shmuel, I'm sorry, when Shmuel and Navi came over to the seven brothers of David, the he tried to pull the oil over their heads, but it wouldn't leave it. Imagine, like trying to pour the oil and it wouldn't leave it. It wouldn't leave the horn. But when the when Shmuel finally came to David, the oil started to bubble up, and it flowed out of the horn and miraculously poured itself onto David's head. So we say Karno. What is Karno? It's the Karen of the oil that poured out to go on David's head to be the chosen one as David Amelech. Another reason why they use the word Karno. Last section of the Beracha. Kili Shuatecha Kivinu Kol Hayom. That all day we are waiting for your salvation or we're hoping or we're aspiring for your salvation to come kol hayom meaning all, always it's another way of saying always so Abir Yaakov the Siddur over here says something very interesting very, something very interesting about it he says that in this particular part of the Beracha this is a, 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 what a person needs to do on a daily basis. He needs to hope, wait, and, uh, and, and, and hope that the coming of Mashiach is going to happen. Meaning it's a mitzvah to, uh, to, to yearn or to have the desire for the coming of Mashiach. Why? So you won't be embarrassed when he passes away. Whoa. What? Why? He says, why? Because when a person passes, he goes up to the heaven and they ask him several questions. Shabbat. I'll read it to you in a second. And they're going to ask him in the heavens, did you wait for the coming of Mashiach? And if you didn't do that, he's going to be very embarrassed in the high heavens. Furthermore, in this particular beracha, your kavana should be that you should wait for your personal salvation. That you should be saved from, God forbid, any uh, uh, any things that might hurt you. So in this beracha, you have to wait. You have to pray for expecting the coming of Mashiach. That you have to do because otherwise, in Shemaim, they're going to ask you why you didn't do it. And also, you pray for Hashem for the personal salvation that you're waiting for. This one I'm going to read. It's short. It's shorter than Masechet Sanedin. It says, Amar Rava. This is Masechet Shabbat, the 31st page on the first side. Besha'a shemachnisin adam ladin. It says, when they escort a person to his final destination for his heavenly judgment after he dies, Omrim lo, the heavenly tribunal tells him, did you conduct your business transaction faithfully? Were you honest in business? Did you set times to learn Torah? Did you engage in procreation? Did you get married? Did you have children? Did you wait and hope for the Messianic salvation? Which is exactly what we're learning. After 120 years, when you go up to the Shema, they're going to ask you, did you hope for the Yeshua of Mashiach. It continues to say, Did you delve into wisdom? Did you uh, learn in depth and learn one thing from the other? Look at that, that has nothing to do with us right now. But we see that when it goes up to the Shammai, they ask you, So when you get to Bracha number 15, Put in your mind that you really are hoping for the coming of Mashiach. Why? Because it's your job. You're supposed to do that. If not, they're going to ask you. There's going to, there's going to be a few questions in the Shammai that they're going to ask you. One of them is, did you wait for Mashiach? And you want to say, yes, I did wait. Every single day in Berchan number 15, I, 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 I thought about Mashiach. I thought about the coming of Mashiach. And also waited for not only for the Yeshua of Mashiach, but for the Yeshua, my, my personal Yeshua, for the things that I am waiting for salvation for. So this is also a good part. 
if if a person is hitting uh, you know some sort of a, a wall in his zivug and his panasa and bearing children in shlombait whatever though it might be you can say over Hashem I'm waiting for a uh, I'm waiting for the salvation, Hashem. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. This is a, a good beracha to add over here, a personal supplication of uh, personal Yeshua. And add on to that, this is something that maybe Elon will uh, appreciate, it's a play on the word. Yeshua Again, when we conjugate it, to your salvation. Who are we talking to? <laughs> We're talking to Hashem. What? We're always talking about us. It's always about us. It's what right. I want. It's what I yeah, want. It's what yeah. we need. It's what we need. Over here, Rabbi Mansur in his book brought something very interesting. Meaning that we're waiting for the salvation of a Kadosh Baruch Hu. What is the salvation of a Kadosh Baruch Hu? Well, we know since we, the destruction of both temples, since we don't have the Shekhinah residing in Yerushalayim, in Bet HaMikdash, where's the Shekhinah? Where's God's holy presence? Exactly. It's in the exile. It's in the Galut with us. So what do we want? What do we say? We pray for the, the Jewish people that are in exile. The Shekhinah is in exile also. So we, and, and by doing that, God's glory is undermined. Because when the Shekhinah is with us, it's a totally different experience. So we pray that it will be restored with the redemption of Amisad. And that should be our motivation in prayer. The Lishuatecha Kibiti Hashem. For Hashem. That we yearn to see the, the Yeshua of, of the Almighty, of the Kadosh Baruch Hu, so to speak. With the restoration of God's glory and all the world's inhabitants to recognize His kingship and authority. Because imagine when the time comes, when the third Beit HaMikdash, that's it. Game over. Everybody knows Hashem is king. Not like the nonsense that's going on right now. Yeah. Right? Also, in our private individual troubles. There's certain sidurim that uh, prompt us in this particular beracha uh, not only to pray for the problems that are facing all members of the nation, which is like right now, we say, Hashem, please let this war finish. Please let the hostages come back. Please let us stay united. Please let, let our teshuvah uh, uh, succeed. But also for our personal salvations, the health issues, the financial difficulties, the infertility, the family problems, the spiritual struggles, all the things, so on, so on. is right here. It's very interesting. I, uh, I was reading a book called Netivot Shalom. And it says over there, I believe it's Parashat Miketsu Vayichi, when, when Yosef was thrown into the pit. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing is over there, of, uh, you know, when a person is in a, in a dire situation, what should he do? So he, he says uh, over there something very interesting. He says when a person feels that he's praying and he's praying and he's praying and he's praying and he's not getting answered, stop praying for yourself and pray for the Shekhinah. He says pray for nothing else except for the Shekhinah to come out of the exile. Because why? Because when Hashem sees that you put all your needs to the side and all you're doing is caring that the Shekhinah should go back to its proper place, you care about me, now I care about you. Sometimes that sometimes the tefillah is not about letting Hashem know what you need. Sometimes it's about letting Hashem know that you care about Him also, and that you care about the state that we're in. The Shekhinah is in exile. The Tivot Shalom says, when you're getting stuck, when you hit a wall, stop praying for yourself. Pray for the Shekhinah to come back to its former glory. Finally, This whole thing, the Shuatecha Kiviti Hashem, and this coming of, uh, of the Messianic era and all that. What are we anticipating? Like, what are we really like waiting for? Peace. You know, certain, pe certain people have an idea of when Mashiach is coming. 
Most people that I talk to is like, ah, I don't have to work anymore, finally. There's no more mortgage, no more nine to five. It's just me and my Gemara all day long, everything's going to be perfect. Is it that? No. Yes. No. The crown of Shem King. What will be the days of, what will the days of Mashiach be like? I was interested to see what Chazal have to say about that. So... This is very, very, very interesting. It says, he says, you know what's the most painful frustration of life? What's the worst feeling to have in this world? Not to live up to your full potential. I could have been, I should have been, why didn't I? Apparently that's the worst feeling a person can have once he leaves this planet. Uh-huh. Once you leave this world, the most painful frustration is unrealized potential. So when we are alienated or in exile, we're not really our real selves. And we're not living our true full potential. What's our true full potential? A Jew living a Jewish life in Israel, in, in a, with a with a third Bet HaMikdash, a reality in our lives, and Mashiach is the king. That's our full potential. Right now we're not living out to our full potential. We have a, a much lower version of an experience and the life that we're living. So it says over here, during the, Messianic, during the Messianic era, every person will have the opportunity to completely realize his potential. To tap all of his inner resources, both intellectual and emotional. Living your best life. Living your best life. That's the days of Mashiach. Furthermore, I'll give you a glimpse into the future. It says, when the kingdom of David will be reestablished, there'll be the rebuilding of the temple, there'll be the gathering of all the Jews that are scattered all over the world, the laws of the Torah will be fulfilled as they were originally intended to, the sacrificial system as well as the practice of the sabbatical year Shemitah, and the Yovel, the Jubilee, will be restored. And once again, we'll be able to observe all the commands of the Torah. All of them. Not like some of the, you know, some yes, some no, some are in Israel, some are when Bet HaMikdash are being built. All of them will be able, all of them will be back on the table. And it says, and this is in Yichot Melachim, it says the Mashiach will not change our religion in any way that the Torah will remain the same forever. Nothing will be added to it, nothing will be subtracted. This is from the Rambam, by the way. And the Rambam continues to say, Do not think that the ways of the world or the laws of nature will change in the coming of Mashiach. He says, What the prophet said, that the wolf shall live with the sheep, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, it's an allegory. It's a mashal, it's a parable, that the Jewish people will live safely, even alongside the wicked nations of the world. All the nations will return to the true morality and will no longer steal from, or from each other, they will not, no longer oppress each other, and they will eat which they have honestly acquired in harmony with Israel. Meaning we'll just have a peaceful existence or, or a peaceful Coexistence, because everybody will recognize the true God and not and uh, and live in peace with the Jewish nation. Continues to say uh, 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 on the reality of in the uh, in the time of Mashiach, he says that in the time of Mashiach, all Jews will regain their independence and they will return to the land of Israel, and the Mashiach will be king. And he will he'll start the government which will be residing in Zion. He'll be extremely famous. He'll achieve great fame. He'll have a, a, a great reputation amongst the nation. Even that greater of King Shlomo. Mm. And not only that, he will cause all the nations to make peace with him and all the people to serve him. And whoever rises up against him will be punished by God and given over into his hand. Rich and poor strong and weak, will exist in the time of Mashiach. But it'll be very easy for people to earn a living. 
and they will be able to accomplish a lot through very little efforts. It will be an age of perfection to which people will become worthy to enter into the world to come. The Mashiach will then die and his son will rule in his place and his son after him and his son after him and because people won't worry, they will last for a very long time. People's lifetime will vastly be extended. Worries and troubles will no longer exist and people will live much longer. And the Mashiach kingdoms will last for thousands of years, as our sages tell us. And when, and when the good is brought together, it will not be quickly dispersed. That's a nice reality. It's not so much different from what we're living right now. It's just like extract all the bad and just do everything as a Jew is supposed to do. And that's the time of Mashiach. That's how simple it could be. But that's how far away we were from it. One last thing. Remember when we said, Et Tzemach David. And we said, Tzemach is the name of Mashiach, Mashiach ben David. Et, the word Et came, Lerabot, Mashiach ben Yosef. The word karno, the karno teu bishuatecha, the word karno also, even though that we're talking about Mashiach ben David, karno hints to who? Mashiach ben Yosef. Why? In this week's parasha and last week's parasha, what, do we say, what does it say about Yosef? Bechor shoro hadarlo. Right? And then we also have ben poet Yosef, ben poet alein, banot sada ale shur. So what do we see over here? That the, the, the shor has a keren. So the karno, oh. meaning the, 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 the Mashiach ben David, can only come after Mashiach ben Yosef did his job. So the et tzemach, and karno, always hints that Mashiach ben Yosef is always going to be first, then Mashiach ben David. Hmm. Baruch Hashem, we finished the bakashot. To summarize, this is where we pray for Mashiach. This is where we pray for our, our, our personal salvation. And this is where we stop asking for our uh, bakashot. The next section is an interesting section because we're entering the section of Hoda'a. And it's also very similar to the, the beginning of Damida. Remember the first three and the final three are, are constant in every single Amida. So those are the ones that whether it's Chol, Shabbat, Hagim, they always begin the same way and they end the same way. So it's always good to go a little bit deeper. I'm just going to give a little bit of a preview. When we get, we're very close to Shomea Tefillah. The Berachah of Shomea Tefillah is probably going to be about, maybe, maybe about five to eight lessons on its own. Because yeah. over there, we're going to go deeply into different ways of praying. Mm -hmm. There's your way, and then there's many, many different types of praying. If anybody has uh, Rabbi uh, Shimshin... Uh, Hirsch? Pink, no, Rabbi Shimshin Pinkus' book on Tefillah. He, it's available in Hebrew and in English. We're going to draw a lot from that book. But when it comes to Shomea Tefillah, we're going to park ourselves over there for some time before we move on to the end. And Be'ezat Hashem, uh, you know, if we're at number 15, we're literally at the end. Once we finish this uh, learning of the Amidah, We'll do a mega siyum. We'll do a very big party. Uh, maybe we'll bring ice cream. I don't know. We'll see what we'll do. And then maybe we'll shift from tefillah and start learning about Shabbat. I was thinking about maybe uh, learning about Eshet Chayil, some of the songs of Shabbat in depth, a little bit different. Uh, you know, that's an introduction to uh, to, uh, to to Shabbat, understanding the, the lichvot Shabbat, all the the food of Shabbat. The, the mindset of Shabbat, there's so much over there, but definitely, yeah. It's going to be hard to learn Shabbat, the Onet Shabbat, unless we all come up with the food real Onet upper class. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so maybe have first Moroccan uh, cooking lessons. So, <laughs> so the first... First lesson about Shabbat is going to be how to make Moroccan fish. <laughs> now you took the words out of my mouth. I'm just going to say that. <laughs>